Yeah, welcome to our lecture where we uh, are now in a section on interest rates. When we were discussing uh, or introducing the forward rate, uh, so I had this definition here on the slide, and this is a little bit a textbook definition yeah, made by a mathematician. Um, the reason is that uh, there is here T2 minus T1, and um, well, T2 and T1 are dates, and we maybe think of these as uh, floating point numbers like uh, 4.5 or 3.6 and take the difference yeah, at certain times and we have some notion of time. But if this is a date, it's maybe not so clear uh, what is the difference of these two times. Yeah? So how do we measure the length of a time period? And uh, this is a convention uh, which will be defined by by day count conventions. Um, so day count conventions define how we measure time. And the thing is that I will give you um, a short look at day count conventions. Uh, I will make a short comment. But in the theory that comes up, I will often just use the T minus S. So I have the T minus S on the slides and this date count conventions, they define the operation T minus S. So they somehow define this operator, the minus when these objects here, they are dates. Yeah or if you like to speak a little bit more in Java or programming, a date time, yeah? a date plus a time. So what is this T minus S? So I often write just T minus S on the slide, but what is meant is that behind T minus S, there is a function, the day count fraction function that uses these two dates S and T and assigns a certain floating point value, a certain numeric value to this. And this value is called the day count uh, fraction. So um, intuitively, maybe we uh, would like to consider time as fractions of a year. So one year, yeah. So say from uh, 20th of August of this year to 20th of August uh, next year is equal to one. Yeah? So one year should maybe have the unit one, uh, but then you already have the issue. Okay, what is if there is a leap year and there's a February of 29th in between? Uh, is this then one plus uh, one day? And where is this one day? Okay, and day count uh, conventions uh, solve this uh, problem. They define yeah, for uh, the evaluation how uh, the time is measured. It's uh, a convention, maybe a little bit ugly for a mathematician, but once you know the convention, you have the function to calculate this and uh, we have it in the computer. Now in the computer, I have an interface that describes uh, what this um, object does. So the object can get a start date and an end date or a start uh, date uh, time and an end date time and calculate this uh, date count fraction. There are many conventions Sorry, there are many conventions on the market. Uh, we can have maybe a look at this um, implementation. So here in our library, there is some package time and in the package time, there is a package day count. And you see here this um, interface. Okay, so I have these two different functions and I have many different um, implementations. Yeah? So for example, here just a small formula that calculates here um, this difference. Uh, if you see something like this here, for example, here for the interface, you know maybe this here is the so-called uh, Java doc. Then there is an, a web page that lists this documentation. So this here is the corresponding web page for this. So you see here the two functions. And on this web page, you also see 
all the classes that implement this. And you can maybe also see the documentation of this class. And here is a nice example for a day count convention, actual, actual. Yeah? So it counts the actual dates, but it has a nice definition here of what is happening, for example, in a leap year. A leap year. So if you cross um, a leap year, uh, then you look how many days fall into the non-leap year and how many days fall into the leap year. So N1 and N2, you count these differently. Um, and then the day count convention is the number of days in the non-leap year divided by uh, 364 uh, and the number of days in the leap year divided by 366. That's actually the reason why this is called actual actual. It is actual number of days divided by actual number of days in a year. And you see there are also some strange conventions like uh, 3360, yeah, so a month has 30 days and um, a year has 360 days. Yeah, so there's some kind of rounding going on and so on. Okay, so that was a small remark on uh, day count conventions. And um, another remark is business day calendars. So if we um, talk about the time discretizations related to our interest rate curve, yeah? so we had this on the slides before, T0, T1, T2, and so on. Uh, then these days uh, or these dates are often associated with payment times or fixing times. So the beginning of the period and the end of the period, maybe. Uh, well, actually, payment, fixing, uh, beginning of the period, end of the period, they are all maybe different days, could be. Um, but uh, if you would like to pay something, the market should be open. So it should be a business day. And if you like to fix something, so fixing means I observe our stochastic process at a certain po uh, point in time. So it means that I observe, for example, my zero cobra bond price. Also, the market needs to be open. So sometimes it is in a financial product required that these days, are uh, business days. So they should lie uh, on business days. And for this, we need some algorithm that creates this time discretization under the constraint that these guys uh, lie on a business day. For example, if you say, I would like to pay every three months, yeah, then you can say, okay, I do it every three months. So it is the 1st of January and so on. Yeah, uh, three months later, April. And um, then the 1st of April, yeah, then um, uh, you need to ensure what do you do if this day is not a business day. So there are the so-called date rule conventions. Uh, so if this is not a business day, you can either move to the next one or to the previous one, or you can have them constraints. Uh, also in the code you find um, you find uh, calendars that describes what is a business day. So if there's a holiday, yeah, like uh, Eastern or something like that. Um, and you also find uh, a thing that is called a schedule and a schedule uh, generator. Yeah? So here there's some complicated code that generates such a schedule of um, business days. So there's a schedule. So a schedule has a payment date, a period end, a period start, uh, and a fixing date. And it can generate these guys um, according to certain constraints. Yeah? So there's here, for example, this schedule generator, and you can define the frequency, the day count convention, the date roll convention, and it will generate this for you. So if you like to create a realistic financial product, then you have to use this. It's not so the focus in our lecture because uh, um, yeah, for us to study the financial products, it's sometimes uh, enough to consider 
more idealized uh, discretizations. Yeah? So for example, 0, 0 0.5, 1.0, 1.5, .0, yeah, for every half year. So that was a small remark on business day calendars and schedules. You find these guys uh, in, in the code. And my next session is on simple interest rate products. Okay, so we have 15 minutes left. So um, maybe I start a little bit this uh, session, but I will start with a recap in uh, the next session. Um, so what we will do is now that we have defined interest rates, like the forward rate, we define some more complicated financial product, fixed Cooper bond, the floating rate bond. And we will also discuss the um, valuation of these products. So we will introduce interest rate products plus their valuation. Okay, and we will start with uh, products without optionality. So these guys are also sometimes called linear products. And um, yeah, we already observed that um, a linear product is maybe something special. Okay, why, where did we observe this? Uh, we had the um, payment of the backward rate at the end of the period. And we used the universal pricing theorem to show that this has the same value as paying the forward rate at the end of the period. So now, since the universal pricing theorem uses the expectation and the expectation is a linear operator, you immediately have the result that this holds for all linear combinations of the backward rate. Yeah. So linearity in paying the stochastic object plays an important role. Um, a second thing is that I make the assumption that if I pay a linear combination, then the value of this linear combination is the linear combination of the individual values. So if you have two contracts that tell you, I pay you that, I pay you this, um, then of course the value of these two contracts as a portfolio is the sum of the values of the individual contracts. Would be strange if it isn't so. Uh, well, the funny thing is that in mathematical finance, we will maybe later observe situations where this is not the case. Yeah? So where the sum of uh, or a portfolio of two contracts uh, has not the same value is the sum of the individual contracts. The reason is that, for example, there may be the legal requirement that um, if you become bankrupt, then uh, you are obliged to uh, pass the money that you receive from one contract to the holder of another contract. So it's not allowed to say, um, if you owe, owe, uh, owe some money, yeah, so you have borrowed money and you need to pay it back, then it's not allowed to say, okay, I'm bankrupt, I cannot pay you anything, but at the same time, receive money from other contracts. So there may be some legal construct that, construct that links uh, somehow individual contracts that appear independent. But in this section here, uh, we are assuming the independence um, of the contract. And so we also assume this linearity in, in value. So we have started by um, defining a single interest rate product. So this is the zero copper bond. 
So it was the financial product that pays one unit of currency. Yeah, so sometimes I should also draw the currency here at time capital T. And I observe the value of this at some earlier time. Yeah, so maybe at some little t. The next object I would like to define is the coupon bond. So this coupon bond is similar. So it also pays one unit, namely at time T n. So I have here time T n. And it pays here one unit. Yeah, so for i plus one equals n in ti plus one, yeah, so in tn, it pays one unit. But it has also some additional payments. It also pays here a constant c times the period length. So it pays here some. CI multiplied with the period length. And it also pays this maybe at other p points. So we have a whole stream of such payments. And also at the last point, we get such a payment in addition. So this is the cash flow diagram. So I will sometimes draw these cash flow diagrams of a coupon bond. Question, what is the value of this financial product? Evaluated say at a time little t that lies before all those um, payment times. So what is the value of this so-called fixed coupon bond or coupon, coupon bond. Well, you see that uh, I can immediately tell you the value of this guy here. The value of the blue one is the value of a zero coupon bond. And also the value of these guys here, they are just scaled zero coupon bond. This here is paid in ti plus one, yeah? So they always pay at the end of the period. Yeah? So this here is ti. So if I know that this here is paid in ti plus one, then the value of this is ci times ti plus one minus ti. This is the amount that is paid multiplied with the price of a zero copper bond that pays one unit in ti plus one. So the value of this in time little t is the same as a zero copper bond that pays in ti plus one observed in little t. But how many of those guys? Well, a fraction of those guys, ci times ti plus one minus ti. So I can value all these individual cash flows because they are just scaled uh, zero cover bonds. In other words, the value can be expressed as a portfolio of uh, zero cover bonds. So if we immediately have this result. So the value of a Cooper bond is just the sum of the individual parts of this portfolio. So it is a, the sum of these coupon payments multiplied with the zero coupon bond price corresponding to the payment time of this coupon plus the zero coupon bond that pays one unit at the end. Um, you see, I, I did not need the universal pricing theorem or evaluation theorem. I could uh, find out, deduce the value just by 
comparing the cash flows to a portfolio that has the same cash flows, namely a portfolio of certain fractions of zero copper bonds. What I have done here is a static replication. I have observed that there is a portfolio of financial products, namely the zero copper ones, which I can choose and which I do not need to change, therefore static, um, which has the same value, replication. Okay, so I can value the coupon bond. Well, speaking of the coupon bond, there is a small term that maybe I can also introduce here before we are finished um, for today. Uh, it is the dirty price and clean price. So if you go back, I have asked myself, okay, this here is the uh, coupon bond. Well, um, this here is the first period. So this here is, T2, um, and you see in my um, valuation, it is that my little t is before T2. Uh, well, that's reasonable because I would like to stay before the payment occurs. And uh, the question is, um, what is the value if I'm already inside a certain period? No, there. Or maybe inside the first period here, there. Um, okay, so if I'm, if I'm inside this period, then of course this cash flow lies in the past. I cannot receive it anymore. Uh, it has already paid. So the value only consists of the future cash flows. Okay, so it just means that this sum here runs from the index that corresponds to the next coupon payment. Which means if you observe the value as a function of time, so maybe I draw here time and I have here my coupon payment. So there's a coupon payment here and here and here. And now I observe the value of this financial product. So maybe the value of the financial product looks like this. Yeah? So it goes a little bit up because I come closer to the day when I receive the money. So it goes up because the bond price here, they converge yeah, to one. Yeah, and if interest rate is positive, bond prices are smaller than one. They converge to one as we reach maturity. And then the value, once this payment has made, drops and it drops by exactly this amount here. Yeah, so this is, CI, TI plus one minus TI. And then the value continues. You know, so maybe it goes up here. Or so maybe it also wiggles a little bit because bond prices are stochastic. But then if I move at this point, the value will again drop. And this is the valuation function of this zero copper bond. And then in the end, I have here the point one plus the last coupon. So maybe here I have the last coupon and plus an additional one unit, or maybe here. So plus my, my one, and then the value drops to zero. Okay, so that here is my value as a function of time. Well, everything is uh, stochastic if the zero copper bond prices are stochastic, but you see that there are these drops. And these drops uh, on the market, if you 
perform a quotation of the price, uh, they are maybe a bit um, yeah, unpleasant. And so it is that you somehow um, take an alternative um, object. So this here is the so-called uh, dirty price. Well, actually as a mathematician, it is a little bit the cleaner object. Yeah, so it is on the market, it is called dirty price. Um, so dirty price is what we have defined with equation uh, 68. So our valuation uh, formula, and this dirty price is sometimes split into uh, two parts, the so-called clean price and the accrued interest. And the accrued interest is just um, a linear scaled. So the time fraction of the next coupon payment. So this is the accrued interest. So the fractional part of the next coupon payment. Okay, and then you define the so-called clean price by just subtracting this fractional part from the dirty price. But for a mathematician, the dirty price may be the nicer object, yeah, and we will we will just uh, also value um, dirty prices. Now the clean price is just a market convention. Um, also on the market, uh, you exchange the true value of the object and not uh, the the adjusted value. Um, so you so you would uh, refer to the uh, uh, dirty price, but in case you stumble across these terms, it is a clean price. You know that there still has to be added uh, the fractional amount of the coupon. Okay, so that was um, a first um, yeah, review of another financial product, the coupon bond. And um, the next thing is, I would like to pay you per periodically um, also a coupon, yeah, so like, like the C, but I would like to pay you um, the forward rate. And this is interesting because if we do this, we will not pay a constant, like we did here every time, we pay a stochastic object. And we ask ourselves, what is the value of this, this uh, repeated payment of the stochastic object? And the nice thing is that by this static replication, we can find <clears throat> um, a very nice expression for the valuation. So that was it for today. <laughs>